Hello and welcome to this week's About Manchester podcast. My name is Nigel Barlow. This week we talk to Jane Kenyon. Jane is the founder of Girls Out Loud. They are a multi-award winning social enterprise, empowering and inspiring teenage girls to step up and shine. They work with schools through intervention programmes and over the past decade have helped thousands of girls across Greater Manchester. Okay, well, thank you for joining us, Jane. We're, we're obviously going to talk about the terrible abduction and murder of Sarah Everard in London and the fallout from that awful incident. But before that, can you just tell us a little bit about Girls Aloud and your role in it? Yeah, sure. So it's Girls Out Loud, don't confuse us. <laughs> Girls Out Loud, which is a completely different thing. Um, so I founded Girls Out Loud in 2010 after spending the previous decade working with women. So I worked with thousands of women as a coach and a therapist. And I had an organization that I set up in 2004 called the Well Heal Divas, which was all about supporting women recognize what they needed to do to shine. And I was doing all sorts of stuff nationally, um, motivational events, training, leadership training, coaching and so on loved it and it was my work with women that led me to work with teenage girls so okay. in around 2007 8 I started to get a little bit antsy uh, about what I was seeing in that kind of arena so uh, we had the highest teenage pregnancy in, in Europe at that time okay. uh, we were just starting to see the stats come out around mental health particularly self-harming uh, we knew that girls aspirations had plummeted and so I thought oh, there's something going on here and I need to kind of have a look. So I'm a woman of action. So I started going out into schools as a speaker and as a motivator and a mentor. And I didn't like what I was seeing. And then I coached quite a few girls that were daughters of women that I'd coached. Okay. Teenage girls, 14, 15. And I didn't like what I was seeing. And um, eventually, long story short, I pitched to run a pilot intervention in a school in Blackpool. Okay. Blackpool had the highest teenage pregnancy rate in Europe at the time. And um, I worked with a very um, difficult group of girls, girls that were considered at risk. Yeah. And I worked with them for six months. Uh, they were 14, no, they were 15, 16 year olds. And it was a baptism of fire for me. It was like, oh my word. Um, you know, I took all the skills that I, I developed as a coach and as a cognitive behavior therapist. I took all my life skills because I also had a difficult youth. And I just poured it into these girls for six months and they completely changed their lives. Um, you know, they totally reconnected to education. They made better life choices. Um, these were girls that were going to be permanently excluded. These were girls that had already been written off. And um, what I proved is that when somebody believes in you and gives you the right tools and techniques, you can change your life. And that's exactly what they did. So those girls are now 27. Yeah. they're all doing really well a couple of entrepreneurs in there a couple of teachers um fine artists so they're amazing girls and they kind of taught me everything I needed to know so I decided after that um I'd called that intervention girls out loud so I took the name and I the following year I set up a social enterprise called girls out loud mm -hmm. and here we are and we work in schools all throughout the northwest um we run mentoring and coaching programs for girls between the age of 12 and 16. Mm -hmm. we run events in schools on every subject you can imagine social media personal safety um, body confidence mindfulness uh, speaking up in class and then we harness the region's talented women female role models who are at the top of their game to become mentors and big sisters to those girls and we connect them and we see those girls shift so that's what we do. Okay. Just can, I, can we just go back to Blackpool? <laughs> we can. Yeah. Um, what was it? What What did you find there, and what What did you think the reasons were? What for those girls? Yeah. yeah, for yeah. The girl. Well, yeah. there are girls like that all over the country. So there are girls that are at risk all over the country. It's not just Blackpool. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a girl that is at risk is generally, she's at risk of being permanently excluded. She's at risk of grooming. She's at risk of being seduced into criminal activity. She's at risk of being recruited into county line. She's at risk of, of being seduced to go out with a boy that's probably 10 years older than her and then all sorts of other issues incur. Um, so these are girls that are coming from chaotic families. 
I mean, chaotic families. Okay. Um, a lot of the time, not safe houses. Uh -huh. um, sometimes they're in and out of care. Um, so they turn up at school and they don't really do very well at school because they don't react very well to authority. So they're used to being like self-sufficient. These girls have been self-sufficient since they were nine. Mm -hmm. They're probably mini mums to their younger siblings. Okay. So, you know, they don't like being told what to do. They don't like authority, reasonably so. So they don't react well to the, to our very restrictive education system. I mean, it's one size fits all, isn't it? And if you don't fit in, you've got a problem and they don't fit in. So they spend more time outside of the classroom than they do in. Even the really bright girls fall behind very quickly. And then they become problems. Then they become the girls that monopolize the teacher time. Um, and, you know, the school doesn't quite know what to do with them. And it really doesn't want to exclude them because, as we know, once you ex when you permanently exclude a young person yeah. from school, yeah. you make a massive impact on their life from a very negative place they fall down the cracks and so on um so they're constantly looking for ways to support those girls and so what i found with those girls is they were crying out for help they were in pain um you know they didn't know what to do they didn't know how to handle it they um even if they wanted to make changes they didn't have the tools to do that they didn't have the coping mechanisms mm -hmm. to do that and so i just was there for them at the right time with the right set of tools with the right experience, with the right skill to get into rapport with them. And I believed in them and together we changed their narrative. Okay. So that yeah, they could reconnect. Yeah, I mean, given what's that, I'm, I'm jumping around a bit here. I will come back to the same Everard thing, but I'm going to follow this up because obviously given what's happened in the last 12 months and the fact that the kids have been out of education for most of that time, yeah. I have great concerns about what's happened to this generation of not just girls but kids in absolutely in absolutely i mean who knows what the impact's going to be there's going to be some um but we don't quite know what it's going to be some some young people will bounce back pretty quickly you know because yeah. the young people that have had family support the young people that have had some e some element of online support um you know some of them will bounce back quickly some of them won't some of them it may take years what we do know that ha happened in in lockdown was that we saw increases in every single area of mental health with young people so mm. we saw increases particularly with girls in self-harming depression and anxiety eating disorders uh, we saw nine times more uh, online grooming than we did pre pre pandemic okay. we saw an increase in sexual assault uh, cyberbullying uh, domestic violence domestic homicide so all of these things went up and some of them went up double um so you know we know that there was a lot of pain going on in a lot of houses um so we will have to deal with the fallout from that and then we'll have to deal with the fallout from them falling behind educationally wise. And also, you know, a big thing for us, because we work in most of our work is in deprived areas yeah. because, you know, that's where we know the, that we're needed and that's where we can make the biggest impact. And that's mm -hmm. what interests me. And we know that in those areas, even in the first lockdown, even the first eight months of lockdown, we reversed a decade of progress on social mobility. Really? A decade. So the kind of gap between the rich and the poor has just got bigger. And so the, the, the poor children and one in three, young, one in three um, children in the UK live in poverty. Right. So those kids are gonna find it harder. They are literally going right back to the bottom of the ladder. And without serious investment, and that, that's money, um, you know, to catch them up. Who knows the impact of that? It could last a decade. How have you been? How has your organisation been able to cope during the last 12 months? It's been, been to tough because we, our models are face to face. Because we're yeah. dealing with girls that have got low confidence, uh, sometimes they're painfully shy, um, sometimes their concentration level is not good, it's all over the place. You know, to do any kind of online stuff is tough for us, but also the schools haven't wanted us to do it. And a lot of the schools we work in are digitally way behind. I mean, some of the kids that we work with haven't had any digital support over 12 months. So, um, you know, they're very toughest schools. So we've done some phone work, and we've done some work with the at-risk girls because we are we were considered key workers, so we were allowed to go into school. Okay. Uh, although I have to tell you, 80% of the kids don't show up. 
So 80% of the kids in lockdown who were considered vulnerable, who the school had to open for, didn't show up to school. Okay. And that's pretty obvious, isn't it? I mean, you know, if all your mates aren't going yeah. and you've been labelled, oh, well, you're vulnerable, you need to go to school. Well, I know what I'd do. I don't think I'd be showing up neither. stigma, isn't it? For yeah, someone. absolutely. Sure. So we did some work in school for vulnerable girls that showed up. Um, but we're just about going back into school now. So we had 12 months of lockdown. We were closed out of schools. We were, we were locked out. Um, and now we're just about going back in. I'm just surprised at that one thing you dropped in there about that most of these schools are not digitally set up. So the chances are that in these schools, the kids have not been having lessons. No, I mean, I'm not naming names, but a school that we're just about to go back into um, has not got the, the, the IT yeah. to even do things for the kids in the school and then even if they've got that yeah. the people that we need to target haven't got that at home so 50 percent of the poorest families in the country are digitally excluded they don't have equipment and they don't have broadband oh. so that again is why that social mobility stat has dropped because they've literally missed a complete year they've had nothing for a year Gosh, you're going to have a lot of work to do. As I said, this is, this is a generational thing. It's, it's, it's going to take a generation to put right And, and the, the thing is about that, we need the money to do it. Yeah. So it's all right saying we've got, we, we have got work to do and we want to get out there, but the yeah. schools don't have any money. They don't have any budget to do any kind of intervention or any of the stuff that we do. So we have to fundraise our own uh, funds to actually go into school and deliver what we do. So, you know, we fund that by the amazing brands and businesses in our area stepping up and saying, we want to put some of our women on that big sister program and they pay for the privilege. They, they sponsor their female employees to do that. Yeah. On the at risk program, we have a patron program again, where we get people that give us money to support those vulnerable girls. Um, and we do a lot of, I mean, I must have spent last year as a full-time fundraiser. That's literally all I did to keep the doors open because we lost 90 grand last year through not being able to deliver, through not being able to run our own fundraising role. Um, so all I did last year is fundraise. And, you know, and I'll be doing the same this year because there's demand from the schools for what we do is high and the support from government is zero. Um, and we have to harness the community that we're in to fundraise to support our work. Okay, okay. Let, let's switch now to what the conversation was going to be about, which is the the events in uh, in Clapham Common. Uh -huh. Nearly two weeks now, isn't it? Um, now you you've written, I've, I've read your blog that you thought that the Metropolitan Police's handling of the the vigil. Uh, made you cry with anger and pain. Is that yeah. because, of because of the way that the police? Well, I, I, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's just that. I think it's uh, systemic of the way we uh, feel uh, about violence against women. It's like mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a pandemic in itself, but we 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 don't want to face it, and so you know we allowed all sorts of protests to take place in lockdown. Uh, we allowed football matches to take place a couple of weeks before that event, and that was all fine. And we have a vigil for a woman that was murdered by, allegedly, by a police officer, mm -hmm. and we decide to handcuff women and take them away and sound, trample all over what was a, what is a... It's not even a demonstration. It wasn't even a demonstration. It was a vigil. Okay. And I just, number one, I was in despair about it. And then I just thought, the optics of this are so bad. Who thought this was a good idea? Seriously, who thought this was the best thing to do? Mm -hmm. And then anger that yet again, you know, when something happens and we raise, it, the profile is raised about a serious issue, yeah. um, it, you know, the, the wrong things are talked about and it's like, will it go away in a couple of weeks and we won't talk about it again? Mm -hmm. Because we raise the profile of something, i.e. violence against women. And murder and kidnap is rare, okay? But yeah. violence against women isn't. Yeah. 
It happens every day. You can speak to any woman and they'll have a story to tell you. It's like the Me Too movement. You know, it brings all this stuff up. Women finally find a voice to talk about it. Nothing changes and it all just goes away again. I mean, what's happened with the Me Too? There's been no changes to anything. No. You know, it's all just died. And my fear, my worry is the same thing will happen here. And we have some serious work to do to keep women safe. Mm. Serious work to do. You are listening to About Manchester's weekly podcast. To find out more about Greater Manchester's premier news and information website, go to www.aboutmanchester.co.uk. Follow our social media channels or sign up for our weekly newsletter. I think I know the answer to this, but what's your reaction been to, the, to what the government said this, this week? You know, the putting more money into having these plain codes, clothes, policemen patrolling nightclubs and... Uh... Well, I don't even understand the logic of it. I don't, I don't even understand the logic of it. Right. I mean, number one, you know, the majority of violence against women is not happening in nightclubs, okay? Right. It's happening on the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I don't understand the logic of having... Uh, undercover cops in in nightclubs or pubs because number one how do I know they're there how do I know as a woman how do I know that they're in there to protect me how do I know how can I distinguish between the good men and the bad men you know what I mean I can't so Mm -hmm. I don't know that they're in there to do that so if something happens to me in that club you know, if a, if a man assaults me or, or you know, d- drags me into the, the, the back of the club or whatever, how do I know that there's somebody in that club that's there supposedly to protect me? And mm. if he follows me out of the club into a dark street, what, what are they going to do about it? So the whole thing, that, that just doesn't make any sense to me. There's no logic in that whatsoever. Okay. Um, the only other thing that's been mentioned is lighting the streets better. Yep. Great. Yep. Well, I mean, that's not just going to benefit women, is it? But also, also, you know, some I've I've walked down well lit streets in Manchester at night and still been, you know, like in fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not necessarily that the that the street isn't lit. It's that it's empty yep. and that somebody's too close to me for comfort. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, you know, I don't know whether they are going to do something. The fear, the fear is there. It doesn't matter whether the streets lit up like Blackpool Illuminations or whether it's dark, you know. So if those are the only two things we've come up with, shame on us. Okay. Shame. Um, so okay, so I'm, I'm going to throw the ball into your court. So what, you know, what needs to happen? Well, what needs to happen is. The first thing is we need some some different there's some changes to our laws. So we need some decent det- deterrent. So at the moment, you can get more for defacing a statue than yeah. you do for rape. I mean, what kind of country do we live in where mm. you know if you, if you mess with a, a memorial, you can get 10 years and you and you don't even you can be out in two for rape. Mm-hmm. Okay. Not only that, there's only a three percent chance of a prosecution anyway. Yeah. So what why bother as a woman if if some if that's happened to you which is a horrific crime. It's yeah. a very very personal crime. It's a very private crime. Why would you report that if you know that what you've got to go through to get it to that stage is also horrific and then you only got a 3% chance of getting a conviction anyway and when you get the conviction they're out in 2 years. Okay. What, what, you know, why would you put yourself through all of that? And quite clearly women don't because mm-hmm. they don't report. So okay. we need to change the legal system. It, okay, so, so, what, so tell me what, in an ideal we world, need to what, have, what, what needs We need to, to have better, we need to have mandatory minimums. We need okay. to make sure that if, if you know, that, that if you rape or you sexually assault, that you are going to go away. And you are going away for a decent amount of time with no, like, get out early clause. Because then it becomes a deterrent and women and women will feel safer because they're like, right, that's okay, because that's going to happen. We need to process women through the legal system better. They need to have better support. There needs to be more police. There needs to be trained police on how to manage that because at the moment it's, it's a I mean, you've got to be a very, very brave woman to put yourself in that system. Very brave. So that's not right. That's not right. Manchester in particular with what's come out over the last few months or is this a nationwide thing? It's a nationwide thing. 
It's an, it is an absolutely a nationwide thing. We need to have more women sat around the table making these decisions, okay? Mm -hmm. So at the moment, the decisions that are being made around anything societal or, you know, that, that's in the system, can you see any women in there? There's, there's one woman in the, in the current cabinet that we all know of, and that's Piri Patel. Yeah. I can't, there aren't any more I know. There certainly aren't any sitting around that top table. There are not enough female judges. There are not enough female barristers. There, there are not enough women that are taking control and having a say in what happens to women. And that can't be right, neither. Mm -hmm. And the final thing that needs to happen is that good men need to step up alongside us. Because mm -hmm. it's okay saying that this is not all men and it absolutely isn't all men but we don't know who the good men and bad men are because you're not wearing badges so mm -hmm. you know we need the good men to step up with us and, and not to be a bystander because this isn't a woman's issue okay if it's anything it's a man's issue but mm -hmm. because it's the men that are actually doing the harm but it isn't it isn't a women's issue and it's become a woman's issue and it isn't it's a society issue mm -hmm. and men have daughters and men have mothers and sisters and wives, and they should be as in fear for them as perfect strangers. And so we need men to not be bystanders. So, you know, we need men to call it out. We need men to call out sexism and, and, and unconscious bias and in, in, institutionalized sex. And we, we need men to step up and say, this is unacceptable. You know, we need to be, we, we need to be keeping women safe because we're doing a dreadful job of it. Dreadful yeah. job. This, this is a societal thing, though, isn't it? This, this is something. I mean, I mean, to, to me, it's when I when I was growing up. I mean, I'm, I'm probably about your sort of age, and and what thirty two? Uh, <laughs> only. <laughs> <laughs> How dare um, you? How dare you? <laughs> attitudes, attitudes have. Ch I mean, to me, attitudes have changed. Men's attitudes towards towards women have changed. They've certainly changed in my lifetime. In what I, way? In what way? Well, I think we're more. I, I think I, I don't. You know the, 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 the you know the office jokes, the office women's jokes that we may have said. You know when I started work, to me don't happen anymore, and I and I feel very uncomfortable either hearing that or definitely saying it myself. So I think uh -huh. things have changed. Uh -huh. What what you mentioned about and not enough women in, in 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 power around the table that that's correct but it's better than it, but it's better than it was isn't it as well so well it, well it is better than it was but it's yeah. not making any change is it because the thing is tokenism doesn't work okay so no. I I've been a token woman on many boards and it doesn't work because I'm yeah. expected to carry the whole my whole gender into a conversation and I can only tell you my opinion. OK, I okay. can't speak for every woman that walks the planet. So the pressure on me just as that one woman. And also, I don't really have much of a voice because, you know, I can't change things as much as I want to because it's only me. There's not enough. You need at least 30 percent to make a shift. Okay. You have to have that. And that's why, for me, I think we need quotas, because unless you get the 30 percent that the one, the token one woman really does not get accepted into the crowd. You know, she has to become a man to get accepted into the crowd. Whereas if there was four of her, yeah, if there was four women on that board, she'd, those four women would have some in input. So, you know, having the odd woman here and there is not enough. And it's well, not I made agree. the changes I it needs to make. I agree with you about the tokenism, but so why then, I mean, you know, population-wise, it's 50% women, 50% men, more or less. So, so what's preventing, why isn't there? you know, 50% yeah. of women on whatever board. Yeah, whatever. yeah what well, is, yeah, I can give you lots of, yeah, or... I can give you lots of answers for that. And, you know, we're very new at it, aren't we? We're, you know, we've only been in the world of work in management positions for 60 years. Yeah. The, the, the kind of, the organisations we're entering are male domains. You know, we're, we're entering organisations that have been set up by men that mm -hmm. are driven by men that are set up with a male culture that have got male values and right and of course they would because we've not been in them so okay. we arrive in an organization 
Mm -hmm. that we're completely out of sync with because you know we don't think the same and we're not the same men and women are not the same we process things differently we think differently we bring different things to the table mm -hmm. so what we're not doing is recognizing that we're expecting women to fit in to a structure that was that's defined as male and women struggle with that because they're not men okay so we need to change the culture there as well but we can't change it unless we get enough women in it women in it do you see what i mean That's so if we've only got the token woman that yeah, token yeah. woman's generally in yeah. the same culture yeah if there were more women then we'd be saying all right well we need to think about differently about doing that because you make decisions like that and the right decision for you but we don't make decisions like that. We make decisions like this and they're the right decisions for us. And when we put them together, oh my God, the power, because we're way more powerful together than we are separate. And we know that. So when we bring all those skills together that in the same organization, that organization is going to be far more powerful, better placed and more successful. But we're very new at doing it. We're not, we're, we're you know, we've got, we've got hundreds and hundreds of years um you know of a culture that is natural to you and is not natural to us at all yeah and it's not natural for you to have us in it neither because you're used to it being that male domain so we both have really to understand how we can coexist in okay. that in that organization and shift the culture to suit both of us okay. uh, and then the magic happens and again that this is a long this is a generational you know it's, it's a generational thing is it's not gonna it's not gonna change the way things happen absolutely won't it won't, it won't happen it, overnight it won't but it won't yeah, happen yeah, at yeah. all yeah. unless we recognize it will it because no. you know acknowledgement and awareness is power so, you know, it won't happen at all if we don't recognize that. All we're doing is passing the same baton on to the next generation without making any of those shifts. So it's like recognizing it first and then starting to put the processes in to shift it. And it will take a while. Um, and then when the new generation come in, it's got it's slightly shifted again and then they do their bit and then the next generation come in and it's shifted again and eventually we'll get to parity but we are a long way off it and and so you know we have to keep our foot on the gas but we also have to you know have men again good men that understand that that understand where we are it's not that we're not talented it's not that we don't want those top jobs it's not that the talent act isn't out there because believe me it is it's that we can't fit in to that way you work, that male way of working. I don't want to be you. I don't want to be a man. You know, I'm quite happy being a woman, thanks. Um, but I don't want to have to behave like a man to get on. I want to get on on the basis of being a woman. I don't want to have to kick off my shoes and, and become something I'm not because I wouldn't be able to sustain it anyway. So, you know, I, I don't, um, I just don't want to be male. And neither do I want to be subservient to a male. I want us to work together and, and that's what we need to look at. And we need to change the cultures of our organizations so that works. Is, is, you know, we're all talking about the new normal, new way of working. Is this, do you, do you then say this is an opportunity as we, as we move to this new normal? Is this, is this the time to grasp the baton, mm -hmm. so to speak? Oh, I think every opportunity is a time to grasp the baton. So you could look at everything and say that. What I do know is that the pandemic has been harder on women. Yeah. I mean, I know that the stats are coming out now that shows that we that work that these the big organizations have lost a lot of women. They've resigned mm -hmm. um, because they haven't been able to cope with being the, the, the primary care of the child carer and doing all the home ed. And, you know, going, I mean, some of them have gone back to being a 50s housewife. Yeah. So, you know, they've not been able to cope with all of that because, again, that's another thing that we need to shift because housework and looking after children should not be in the woman's domain if she's got a full-time job mm -hmm. you know if you both work if 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 like mom and dad husband and wife both have full-time jobs then we need to take a team approach to the rest of our life don't we but unfortunately in a lot of cases that's not happening and so the woman goes out to work and still has all the stuff to do at home and that's another reason why the world of work is difficult because right. the shift hasn't been made at home so it's like it's not having it all it's doing it all 
Right. So we need to teach the next generation at different values because they're going to be also going to be dual income families, aren't they? I mean, because you know, how many people can afford to not have both working if you want a family unless you're uber rich? If you want, if you want, if you want a family, you want a nice house, then it's impossible. Absolutely. Right. So, so the next generation and the next generation after them, unless they're, you know, the top 1% in the country in terms of wealth, they will both be working. There's no two ways about that. So we need to teach them a different way of, of making that work because it doesn't work if they don't both take responsibility mm -hmm. um, and decide who's going to do what or take it in turns or, mm -hmm. you know, um, sort of say, well, you know what, the next five years I think is critical for me in my career. So I want to focus on that. And the other partner says, brilliant, your turn. Okay. I'll do this. And then when that five years is over, it switches. So there are lots of ways to make it work. And I know that there are lots of men that would, would like to take paternity, that would like more, more time with their kids. Mm -hmm. You know, we just need to make that part of our culture. That's the way, that's the way it works. Is, um, do you see any country out there that's doing this? Isn't there are a lot, it? most of the Scandinavian countries, most yeah. of the Scandinavian countries uh, are getting those, are ticking those boxes in terms of Right. equality in the workplace in terms of parity at the top in terms of shared paternity so they call it family leave and they don't get it unless they share it right. so they can have up to 12 months but they've got to share it okay. um so it's accepted that that's what will happen so i think a lot of the time in the uk there are probably lots of men that would like to do that but feel the pressure of work that that that's not acceptable or, or that you kind of henpecked or that you're like oh you're under the thumb aren't you so mm -hmm. they don't do it and they would really like to do it okay. whereas because it's part of the culture in those countries it's accepted okay yeah so is that can that be changed by legislation can, can we could could we just make that more we could uh, yeah we could we we brought family, we have brought we have brought legislation in that says that men can have more paternity leave. Uh, unfortunately, not many of them are taking it. They don't take it. And good. that's a culture thing again. That's right. back to that culture that even though they might want it, it might not be deemed the thing to do here. Right. You know, it might be like, oh, you're a bit of a wuss, aren't you doing that? It might not be deemed because if it's a very macho culture, um that might be deemed not the thing to do so even though we're giving it them legally they might not take it okay i'm, I'm getting to the half an hour and there's, there's a lot more i want to discuss but i'm, <laughs> I'm going to get shouted at for this going on too <laughs> um can, can we just sort of a sort of a final message sort of yeah. going back to the going back to the the starting point with, with the sarah everard thing what, yeah what, what did you say to to we're coming out of lockdown. People are going to start going out again. What, 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 what would you say to the, to the women of Greater Manchester? What's your message to them? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that I'm having to say anything to them. It breaks my heart that I'm having to to give any woman, you know, advice on how to look after herself or personal safety because she shouldn't have to do that. Yeah. And, and they're very confused messages, aren't they? You know, it's like on the one hand, we're about empowerment and we're about stepping up and we're about equality. And then on the other hand, I've got to tell them, but hey, there are men out there that want to hurt you. So you still need to be vigilant and you still need to do this and you still need to do that, um, you know, because if anything does happen and it could be your fault then, because it's your fault for doing this and it's your fault for doing that. The women of Greater Manchester know what they need to do. They do not need me to tell them. OK, that's lovely. Thank you very, very much. It's been Pleasure. great to talk to you. and I'd, Pleasure. Hopefully we can talk again. Absolutely. Nice. We've got lots more to talk about, I'm talk sure. Again.